and welcome to Season 2 of Walk Like a Hebrew. I'm Jody O'Dell. On this podcast, I talk to fellow believers, many of us former Christian churchgoers, who have discovered the truth of the whole Bible. We discuss how we got from there, wherever that was, to here, and what exactly it means to walk out our faith like the most famous Hebrew in history, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. This is Episode 20, an interview with Mark and Cherie Olson of Northern California. Cherie was the sister who introduced me to the concept of keeping the Sabbath according to what was actually written in the scriptures, and she and Mark have become some of our very closest friends. I cannot express how much I love and value these people. Mark and Cherie are funny and can be rather irreverent, and our conversation was full of hilarity and hope. We talked about the Pesach messages only Christians would understand, who exactly the biblical feasts were for, and Mark might drop a bomb in there about Jesus as he wonders some deep things about the Sabbath. Walk Like a Hebrew is entirely listener-supported. If you're enjoying these testimonies and you would like to make a one-time or recurring donation, please visit sheholdsforth.com slash donate. And now you can also support us through Pod Hero, a $5.99 per month subscription service that makes it easy to support your favorite podcasts. Check it out at podhero.com. Welcome to Walk Like a Hebrew. I am here with Mark and Cherie Olson. How are you guys doing? Gorgeous. We're doing great. Thank you. Good. Beautiful August. August is typically very hot. Tell me about yourselves. Okay, uh, I'm Mark, and uh, Sheree and I have been married now for, uh, well, we 30 years this April. And we have two kids, uh, our son, son Tiger, right, and our 19-year-old daughter. We have a dog and three cats. We live in a wonderful mountain community in California. We grew up together in a beautiful Southern California community, and uh, we met while waiting tables. That's right, at a restaurant. Jesus. I grew up Presbyterian, and I tried a bunch of churches because I had lots of questions that couldn't be answered, so I tried the Catholics, Pentecostals, Church of Christ, Lutheran, Methodist, Jewish. Tried a whole bunch. You could always find me at a youth group in high school. That's what I thought was a fun thing to do. Uh, I was raised as a Lutheran, and so therefore I only had one goal, which was not to have to sit in uh, the service. <laughs> And then uh, later on, as I was in the Air Force, I met, of course, the Baptists. They're everywhere. And they suggested that uh, reading the Bible and having a personal relationship with Jesus was where it was at. Nice. And that uh, was very nice. And then eventually, we started reading the Bible again. This is many years later. And was surprised on what it was saying. Okay, so so there it is. You guys, you have to tell me, what's the story? How did you get from there to here? Like, what was the thing? What was the catalyst? Some of the things were, you would say, I guess it would be a smaller event that showed some things that you hadn't considered or seen before. Okay. And, you know, the Jews for Jesus, their, um, their Pesach. Yes. They come by and they, they have all these... Uh, traditions that are displayed within the keeping of the Pesach or the Passover meal by the Hebrews that actually make sense only to Christians. You know, like the, the bread being striped and pierced and that the bread is hidden. Specifically for me, it was that Passover Seder. That was the first time I'd read in the Bible that the Lord commanded the children of God to celebrate this feast forever for all time throughout their generations, wherever they may live. And I thought, well, we just sang children of God, right? It was a nice, nice Calvary chapel we attended. And, and so I asked them, I said, is this really what it says? Oh, yes. I said, but aren't we a children of God? Didn't we just sing that song? Well, no, that's not for us. Well, I love a party. I really do. I love a party. I love, I love Shabbat because every week's a party. But, um, the idea that I had missed 40 years of parties was not okay with me. I felt like somebody cheated me. And so I went and looked it up. I asked every Christian woman whose walk I admired, who I felt was a strong Bible believing, not just theology and doctrine, but they believed what the word of God said. Doesn't this say that this is forever and all time? And aren't we a children of God? Because it says that a children of the LORD. And I'd always thought it said Hebrews. This is a feast for the Hebrews, but it didn't. It said it was for the children of God, which included us because we're the children of God. It even says so in the New Testament. 
it took about a year for me to be quite convinced that all of this was for me too, that I had missed like half the Bible, which was a huge bummer to me. I mean, I knew them as stories, but I didn't know them as truth. And the good part was that you, Mark, you came with me at the same time, but it wasn't the, hey, the feasts of the Lord are for the children of God. For you, it was Shabbat. You saw Shabbat the same week I saw the feasts. Yes. Yeah. And there, what, there was another thing that was big helpful to us was that we knew previously, sorry to drop any bombs on your show, that Jesus was actually a good Jewish boy. So we knew that already. We knew as Christians he was a Jew. I know. Right. Shocker. And that his last name wasn't Christ. <laughs> that it wasn't Joseph and Mary Christ and little Joseph. Christ. And his adopted brothers and sisters, if you're Catholic. <laughs> but anyway, so when some friends invited us to a Saturday Bible study, we knew them from when we first got up here. We were both joining the same church at the same time. And of course, we eventually fled the church, run out, fled. Fled. Anyway, we were in a non-trusting mode when we ran into our dear friends, Ron and Pam, and they said, come on, we'll have a Saturday Bible study and we'll fellowship and we'll have food. And we said, excellent. But yeah, you saw Sabbath the same time I saw the feast. Yes, that was a big deal. One of the Bible studies, I guess it would be right at the beginning, if not mm -hmm. the first, was the repetition of remember my Sabbath. You know, just over and Six over. Six days you shall work, but the Sabbath you keep. Right, that was all I heard. You know, it was like, hey, wait a minute. How did we not keep the Sabbath when it says, I mean, literally over and over and over and over, don't mess with my Sabbath? Well, we were so smart, we had to read a book called From Sabbath to Sunday to figure out, oh, they changed it. The same people who created geologic column, evolutionary Darwinian thinking just made it up. They just made it up a few hundred years earlier. So that was like a huge disappointment because once again, we'd been lied to. Yes, I, we did the woe is me, we'd been lied to dance for about a year. Because it was real shocking. I trusted these people, but yeah. they didn't know any better. So so what has your journey been like? I mean, I know that's a really broad question. But, you know, specifically, like, what are some of the things that you have had to change? I know you guys have been doing this for a while. How long has it been? Coming up on, yeah, 13 yeah. years. So, and the, the first thing that I noticed, all of a sudden I can see what's there. And my understanding is, of course he means everything he said in the Old Testament. <laughs> Duh. And then I looked around and there was no one there. You know, in the, in the spiritual place where I was, I looked around and I was thinking, I'm not the only one who can read English. Where, where are the rest of the people? Where's everyone? That was, it was a mental journey, which ended with me saying, well, I have to follow what I read. That's where I'm going. I'm not going to not do that. Otherwise, I'm that fool to be pitied because I'm saying there is no God. And if there is no God, boy, what a waste of time. We had a lot of things to back out of because our kids were very young, very, very young, single digits when we came here. So there were things like 4-H that were Saturday driven. Eventually, our martial arts teacher created a special testing day for us and one other student who had of religious observances. So he made a Sunday testing date so our kids could finish their black belt because testing date's always on Saturday, like throughout the whole world. Not going to change that part of the world. And then we had to figure out how to enjoy Shabbat, which is funny because for a person who enjoys a good party, you thought that would be easy, but it wasn't. We didn't know what was permitted. We didn't what know was... what to do. No. And then we had to learn how to have feasts because we had the first few years by ourselves, which is not much of a party, even with four whole people. It's just not that exciting. And then we freaked out people we liked. We're like, come to a party. We don't know what we're doing. It's on the state. We don't know why it's important. <laughs> we were getting there. A lot of it was like talking people that we loved off of the ledge. Like uh, my mother at first thought perhaps we thought everything in Christianity was wrong and we were all going to hell if we weren't doing it my way. And I said, oh, heavens no. I don't know anyone who does it my way in our walk. We all do it our own way until the Lord comes back to tell us differently. We do our best to figure out what it says and do it. So it's just a matter of doing it, not a matter of believing a certain thing. So that was nice to be able to, to get rid of that separation with people I loved who were still in a Christian walk. 
giving up the food thing was different. When we finally could read English and saw that said he didn't think it was, you know, an abomination to even eat pork, let alone shellfish. Shellfish was a release to me. I was so relieved not to have to eat that disgusting stuff anymore and not seem unsophisticated. Now I could be religious, which was a better excuse, and I preferred it. But pork, one of my problems when we first came to this walk was I'm in charge of the budget, and I know how far we can go. And more than half our meat budget was pork. How am I going to get protein into my family without pork? Which actually turned out really easy once we could no longer eat out at places, and we just bought organic stuff. It seemed you know, between beans and eggs and fish, it didn't seem really, I don't know why I thought that, but I did think that. And it was a budget issue. Yeah. And I think that's pretty common. I mean, it was a, it was a thing for us. What? No more little Caesars pepperonis on our way to Iwana? Right. <laughs> yeah. Pepperonis. Well, there was also the shedding of the holidays that we grew up with, right? Yeah. You know, the spring holiday, Easter and all the... Eggs and chocolate were easy. <laughs> Accoutrement, that's a good word. The accoutrement that goes with it, that was that was easy to shed, right? Because it didn't make sense before. But Christmas was something that we had both shared with our families, and it was always special family get-togethers, great times, right? So that one was a little tougher. And, you know, it took a couple of years to realize we were being disloyal. To the God of the universe, because we were weak. And we'd also it was learned funny enough too. because when <laughs> when we when we first started seeing that the uh, Old Testament and the Torah were for us also, we began to see all the traditions that we had been given, and so we were really really nervous about picking up new traditions that were going to interfere with the Bible, just like the ones we were just getting rid of. But, you know, within a few years, the time it took us to shed Christmas, we had also learned that Hanukkah wasn't just some, you know, it wasn't a secular Jewish holiday either. It had deep meaning in the fact that the Torah was not destroyed in Israel by the Greeks when they occupied. So that was amazing. I was just thinking about regrets, and it was really hard at first to leave my Christian friends and my Christian family, I mean, there's ministers in my family. We have a long and what I consider very beautiful heritage. And there was a part of me that hurt that I was turning away from that. I was afraid that my own family would feel I rejected them, which wasn't true. I felt very much like my family gave me this birthright, which is such a privilege to be born into believing the Bible is true. Just basically, the Bible is true. And Jesus loves you, and God loves you, and he's a loving father. To get that, because I got lucky in my birth, I didn't want them to think I was spurning my heritage, my my inheritance. And it was important to me to express to people like my mother and other people who were leaders to me in this, that you had led me to God and Jesus, and Jesus led me to Yeshua, the good Jewish boy, who showed me what Torah was, which was him in words. And it's such a pleasure. It's such an easy thing to do. There's a list. I don't have to guess what's required of me. I have a list. I know what's required. I can do that. It's an easy list. It's not hard. Actually, it's pretty fun. And and you can play with your marbles. You can get as deep as you want or keep it as, as easy as you need. And he's not a harsh taskmaster. He's not going to make it, well, you really should be doing better than this, so I'm squishing you. He's not that kind of guy. He's not a killjoy. I'm sorry you were enjoying that part of your life. We're taking it away. This isn't who he is. He's this amazing father who looks after these crazy little girls like me in church who ask all the annoying questions as well as the people who just go, oh, okay, that's great. So I don't have to wonder, did I take the wrong path? Did I dishonor my family name, which actually does mean a lot to me. You know, when we look back at what our heritage was and the difficulties our family's been through over 1,200 years, I don't want to be the failure. I don't want to be the one that led us off, you know, the cliff of what's wrong with you. And so it's important to me to know that, no, God brought me back. He brought me to a place where I can sit and not feel out of place when I meet my forebears. So what do you call yourselves? When somebody says, you know, what's your religion? You know, especially because it's such a big part of your life. And everything you do revolves around it. I'm sure there are questions. 
my two favorite expressions are either that I'm like the gonzo in the world of Muppets. We are the gonzo of the religious world. We're the whatevers. Nobody knows where we can't. We're just them. Those strange little blue hook nose whatevers. Or scripturally observant believer from Nehemia Gordon. He calls us SOBs. <laughs> Tell me your top three favorite teachers. Uh, Dot. And <laughs> Dot Olson. Dot Olson, because her message is so consistent and so easy to remember. Because if you're having a problem somewhere or an understanding, she says, go read the Torah. Read the Torah. <laughs> that's Best what teacher. she says. That's that's her whole teaching. Go read the Torah. Number one teacher. Right? Oh, not, awesome. fr- not from her mouth, but from his. Go read the Torah. And, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know how. Just read the Torah. But it doesn't talk. Go read the Torah. What about the moon? Read the Torah. So and, and then we have uh, uh, Brad Scott. He really blessed God and blessed us by being humble and understanding that we didn't see everything and that nobody had all the answers and that the Bible... The Torah were simple to understand, not to comprehend in fullness. That's not simple, but it's simple to understand, right? The calendar is really easy and the week is really easy. And you understand and you see it and you see God's word bloom. I mean, you you see it bloom in the real world and you see it bloom in people who are challenged by it, right? Because we don't evangelize. It's like, I'm... I'm not telling you anything. I'm saying what you're saying. It says it doesn't say you should go read it. (laughs) And it works because they'll get mad and they'll go to prove you wrong. (laughs) And Nehemi, of course, who is, while he's not a believer in Yeshua, his knowledge of near Middle East ancient culture and original Hebrew is unparalleled. It really is. And it's weird how a Jew, Karaite, from an Orthodox family, can actually deepen my belief in a savior he doesn't yet accept, although he's willing to accept it if when he returns, his name is Yeshua, which makes me giggle, because it's like, oh, cool, you already know his name. <laughs> yeah, Nehemiah is like a, a keel for us, because most of the folks that we know a good expression. have deep desire and have become fantastic learners. But we did not grow, for the most part, we did not grow up, you know, keeping the Jewish feasts. For the most part? We called it Pentecost, Shavuot. That's the closest we came to a Jewish feast. No. No? No. No. Because we had Yaakov Yaakov, who uh, who was a Jew and a Christian. So he could, but anyway, but he was not our, he was not a teacher. He was learning uh, parallel with us. And so to, to have a teacher who will call the covers on anyone who's taking things out of context or, you know, changing the context, he's like, no, you can't do that. This is what Jews do. That doesn't work like that. And so it's really great to, to have him there as a back check and. And he's a good friend. He's a good scholar to know and because he doesn't have guile or ulterior motives, right? He just loves the Bible. Yes. Anyone else noteworthy you want to mention? Oh, my gosh. So uh, many. 119, very helpful. Not right. everything, but very useful, very graphic. The, the Bereans. Bereans Re- online. Faithful oh, studiers. Yes. Faithful studiers. Fantastic. If you've got a week, they are perfect. This is not something for the, I'm going to dip into it while I'm sitting doing something else. Right. These are... Oh, and if wonderful. you're working on your doctorate in Torah, then you definitely need the... Who is it? The rabbi's son? The rabbi's son. Oh, who yes, each so. week writes a dissertation. Bill Bullock. Fantastic. He's wonderful. <laughs> yes. You write a dissertation every week. It's wonderful. Yes. And they're just so lyrical. Poetic, beautiful. <laughs> I totally dig the music and the dance thing too. Just gotta say for the girls, because most girls I know kind of are into dancing, even if the guys aren't. So that's one of the things I really love in Hebrew dance is the girls can get together and have it on and yes. really right. go for it. Well, and very often the guys join in. They do. They do. There's another thing too uh, about being biblicists, Bible believers, whatever we are, SOBs. When we get together, I, I see people always helping the other people. And I, I've seen that at churches before, but I don't hear any gossip, which I don't recall not being aware of when I'm around people. Uh, but the biggest thing is 
that I really love is that when we sit down and we get together and we open the Bible, that we are free to interrupt, ask questions, bring an opposing understanding or whatever. And nobody is being trained to just hear and return information. You actually have to understand what you're reading and fight for it. Keith Johnson says, interacting with the word. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Which is not something that you get to do in yeah. a regular church no, setting. No, we chew on it. We mm -hmm. do. We go on <laughs> rabbit trails. Sometimes we choke on it. Oh my gosh. I don't know if you Sometimes know this. Sometimes we savor it. So our first few years into this, we, uh, we started pulling doctrines up like you might just out of a hat. And it was fun because you could take something that bothered you and see if there was actually anything to it or was it merely a, a tradition of a man. And so one of the first things we yanked on was hell, naturally because hell bothered me. The idea that I'm in paradise and people I love who did not choose God for a variety of reasons are somewhere smoking and burning and suffering, I couldn't quite reconcile that. I figured God is smarter than me and so he could, but I had a really hard time with that. And for nine months, some other new people who were actually reading the Bible, but from a different discipline, and us went back and forth on the issue of hell or annihilation or something else. What does the Bible say? It took me nine months to tear apart one doctrine. And I had all the time in the world. If it took me two years, they wouldn't care. Right. Where can you do that? No, that's, that's definitely not something that's acceptable in the church. Well, I think that's it, guys. Thank you for having us on. It was very oh, nice yes. to be with you again. A pleasure talking to you again, Jody. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Walk Like a Hebrew. You can follow us on Facebook or Instagram at Walk Like a Hebrew. And don't forget to share this podcast with friends and family. Many thanks to Jack Lane for the music, as well as many other things. Thank you, Jack and Marty. I love you both. To get a free copy of Jack's CD, Lord, I Lift Your Name, send an email to jacklane at earthlink.net. May Yahovah bless you. We'll catch you next time.